Um, before uh, opening the f uh, question to the floor, let me ask one question to all, uh, let's say, uh, panelists. The question is that if renewable energy becomes a mainstream, and uh, certainly the demand for fuel moves away from fossil fuel, regardless of what Mr. Trump is uh, pushing, uh, and demand for oil, demand for gas declines, and the oil price getting from $80 per barrel to $8, for example. Just for the sake of our uh, brainstorming or scenario analysis as such, does this low price of oil certainly impact Saudi Arabia, Iran, or Middle East, or Russia, and also United States with the shale production? Does this kind of new world with renewable energy means more peace in the Middle East, or well, the other way around, more war or battle because of uh, the, let's say, battle for the uh, diminishing uh, returns or profit. What do you think, Oribier? Uh, first, uh, it's clear that uh, the oil consumption will continue to increase. And, uh, uh, yeah, but it will happen in uh, 40 or 50 years from now. So I'm afraid that in between there will be many, many revolutions in the Middle East. God. Um, well, uh, for renewable energy to become mainstream, I mean, here again, you will need, uh, these are intermittent technologies, so you will need a lot of gas, a lot of storage, etc., et right, as, right. as we mentioned, right? So, but I, I'm, I'm willing to play the game. Uh, it, it really depends on when that will happen. So if you assume in, 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 in 40, 50 years' time, I mean, uh, a lot of these countries, I'm hoping, will have time to implement some of the reforms that they have engaged. Uh, but here again, I mean, it's very difficult to put all the countries in the same basket because I, I think your second graphic, uh, uh, Tanaka-san, showed how the, 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 the regions are evolving. The countries are becoming importers, exporters at the same time, and being exposed to oil and gas prices totally differently. So I, I, would, not, I would not like to simplify it by putting just one, uh, giving one, just one statement, but I think for some countries there will be uh, an imperative to push to uh, some reforms uh, more extensively than others. Do, do you think Saudi Arabia... I thought I was not talking in the... <laughs> <laughs> I said it like three times. I, I am not... <laughs> I am very stubborn and sticky to a so, difficult so, question. So what, what was the question? Uh, will Saudi Arabia survive with eight dollars of oil? In when? Uh, when? 2030. Yes. Okay, good. How about you, Dr. Cooper? I'm with Olivier. I don't want to play the game. Uh, if we can play that game, we can imagine we have a magic wand uh -huh. and just typically what we want. That's science fiction. Yes. So, so I'm not willing to play your okay, game. I, or if you want to play that game, I'm allowed to put in some other things as well. Uh, like, what, like what? A magic wand. A magic which, wand? Which you no. well, Mr. Cooper. point at the relevant countries okay. and uh, say, keep peaceful. Ah, for the uh, magic wand for the peace. I, just because, you know, my exercise of this kind of volatility you know, many companies are making the scenarios for, pre for preparing for the unprepared situation, I mean, or uh, very much volatile situation. So, so, yes, science fiction is true, but without thinking uh, this kind of very unpredictable situation, well, think, we are, we are in trouble. Well, think 35 decibels barrel rather than $8 a barrel. 30, okay, so <laughs> what do you think about the 30 dollars or barrel then? I think Dr. Saudi Cooper? Arabia will survive 35 uh -huh. dollars uh -huh. with hey. difficulty, but it will survive. 35 is very easy for Saudi Arabia. I think production yeah. cost is much cheaper. And eight so. is impossible to yeah. imagine yeah. without a magic wand to go along with it. 
Well, let's see in 2030 what the oil price would be. I, I, I mean, uh, you know, who knows? And uh, this is a difficult thing, but, uh, uh, you know, without thinking about unprepared situation, Japan faced such a big mess after the uh, crisis in, uh, in, in earthquake and nuclear. So prepare for the unpreparedness is, unprepared situation is, is very, very important. Do you want to play the game, Masuda-san? Yeah. I think there is one, one condition, if I may go along with this, what you said. When I was the director of the IEA in charge of oil market, oil prices were uh, single digit. I got a call from Riyadh from my friends and they explained how difficult it is to survive, but said we'll be able to survive for a while. Anyway, if oil prices should go to $8 per barrel or 10 the renewable energy needs another revolution. Photovoltaic is old, old technology. It's already 150 years old. Already technology. We need revolution, revolution. One or two, then make renewable more sustainable and easy to provide. And probably there will be peace in the world because this integrated supply system, consumption system, is more peaceful than in Tibet. So I go along with what Tanakhsan said. That's Thank what you. happened. Thank you. Laila has some additional comments. Yes, I mean, before getting to, uh, to uh, your $8 figure that I think uh, a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of us disagree with, uh, in my second slide, I think I showed all the different levels of, of, of cost breakdown for different countries. So, uh, I mean, before it reaches the low-cost producers, uh, I mean, the Russians and Saudi Arabia and, and others, I mean, you'll have other countries who, which will be in deep trouble before that. Right. So I don't think the industry will stay uh, not doing anything before that happens. How about you, Ladislav? Well, uh, I, I play the game because, uh, and, and by the way, let's remember that at the end of the 90s, the oil price was one digit figure. Yeah. So what uh, seems to me as, as a company important is to take into account not the fact that it will be forever, but that there is cyclicality. And cyclicality is something you can play with by being counter-cyclical. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the, of, the, of the answer to the question saying, first, by the way, we, we realize that even in the two-degree scenario of IEA, I mentioned 22% for oil, but it's about 50% for oil and gas. Mm -hmm. And we should not forget that in, in your question at the end, it's for oil and gas because uh, these countries produce both. So, and 50% of the mix under the two degree scenario, it's quite challenging to imagine that you'll get to, uh, uh, to reduce that very significantly. But even if that was the case, and that happened in the past, I think that investing counter-cyclicality is, is, is definitely one of the, uh, of the answers to the question. So, so, so you mean, you mean uh, Total will survive? Of course. <laughs> okay, Mr. Ku Dr. Cooper, yes. Yeah. Question of uh, Ladislas. Uh, he, one of his four points or five was renewable bio biofuels. What do you have in mind exactly? Because uh, the biofuels I know about, which are eth corn-based ethanol and palm oil-based fuels, are terrible from a climate change point of view. So what biofuels do you have in mind no. as a part of a solution? Right. The, the, the one that actually we're talking uh, about is really the current biofuels that are being produced because uh, that's right, that second generation, third generation biofuels remains extremely challenging from the techno technological point of view. But I made that point because I think that's one of the areas where public policy today is helping the case, at least in terms of uh, emissions, because, and, and we don't see that that often on other aspects. There is some in energy efficiency where there are some mandatory objectives that are imposed by public policy, but for instance, we don't really see it on carbon pricing. So I took the example of biofuel saying, ah, at least here, there is a level of incorporation which is made 
uh, mandatory and at the end which uh, helps the case even though I agree that the impact in the future of additional uh, um, biofuels may remain quite uh, limited at the scale of the challenge that we face. Thank you very much. I will open the floor to the questions first. Uh, Don Johnston, my former boss. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, <coughs> my name is Don Johnston, and I was the Secretary General of the OECD from uh, 1996 to 2006. So I had the pleasure of actually having uh, Nabula Tanaka, our, our chairman, as uh, one of our first class directors in the organization. Speak up or to the mic. Oh, I'm not close enough to the mic. But I just wanted to make a few observations. So I've been following this dossier for a long time. In fact, I chaired this. I think it was in Doha, where you, you were then with Total, were you not? And Total, you made a very impressive presentation, as you have. I think Total is actually probably quite exceptional in many respects. But you know, we're really talking here, I, I don't want to sound cynical, but I've heard the story so often, so long, going right back to uh, 1992, there's Rio, and then I came to the OECD, and 97 was the big year. That was the year of UNGAS, you know, the United Nations in general session in, in, in New York, which, which I addressed, we heard all the terrible things that we were gonna cure in the next few years. We had Kyoto, uh, where other countries undertook, you know, and we had annex and non-annex, and Canada, for example, undertook to reduce its, its um, its emissions to uh, 1990 levels, you know, it was something like X percent. In 2010, it abandoned Kyoto because it increased by 25 percent. And we've seen this right across the board. So, you know, really, what I'd just like to say is when you get out of the discussion here, you are talking, you're talking mitigation. That means trying to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, which we've been uniquely unsuccessful in doing or adaptation. I don't hear enough about adaptation. I mean, the fact of the matter is, look at the world today. Look around what's happening. Uh, the forest fires in the western United States, in Canada, in northern Sweden, above the Arctic Circle, the temperatures and so on. So I think you have to think in those terms. I'd like to see you talk more about adaptation and less about trying to meet these uh, targets. Finally, it's that, uh, that the people start discussing about adaptation, just as you said. Yes, that's true. Please. Yeah, uh, we, we, we spoke quite a lot about long term. Uh, being on the market, I'm more uh, short term minded. And being short term minded, I would like to have your views about uh, uh, the future of uh, our different commodity prices. Uh, of course, I understand. Uh, Mrs. Ben Ali doesn't represent Aramco, but uh, I would like to know uh, how much oil so, uh, Saudi Aramco and Saudi Arabia can pump more in the short term. Can we, can, can we reach $100 uh, dollars per barrel or perhaps more? Uh, you spoke, uh, we spoke much, of, uh, of course, about the price of oil. But I'm also struck by the price of natural gas. Natural gas prices have, been, uh, uh, have never been so high since the Fukushima crisis. And uh, they, it's really a long-term trend. Uh, with Ladislas, we spoke about the commoditization of the uh, LNG market. Uh, what's your view on the future? And by the way, it was said by uh, Mrs. Ben Ali, uh, the price of coal is pretty high, and the demand for coal, be it uh, steam coal or cooking coal, is uh, pretty high. So we are dreaming about uh, uh, renewables, but on a short-term basis, we are uh, really uh, with almost an energy crisis. Thank you. Uh, for the question, yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, as we are in Morocco, I would like to say that what was mentioned during the debate, that uh, here we can confirm what we lived in this country, especially with renewables. You heard Mr. Bakuri during the lunch, but the price that we reach on the project on wind is three cents per kilowatt hour, four cents for PV. It's big power plants produced by private companies and selling to this price uh, to, the, to the utility. So it's true. 
we are working to have 52% of our electricity capacity in 2030 from renewables. It's possible because we have interconnections with Spain, with Algeria, soon with Portugal and Mauritania. It's also possible because we have water pumping for storage. We have also melting salt for storage in Warzazat and also batteries. We're talking about big projects, but don't forget, especially for Africa, how small projects, PV roofs, PV pumping, can be used in the whole continent. And it's something that is as important as big power plants. But there's also these solutions that can be also something important. Last point, I'm hitting the Moroccan Agency for energy efficiency. And I think the cheapest way, the fastest way of reaching this climate indices is through energy efficiency. We should work on energy efficiency in industry, transport, housing, public lighting, agriculture. In all those sectors, we have a program for that. So that's also as important as the big problems. That's as my observation. Thank you. Thank you. Are you from Massen? No, I'm from Ami. It's the other agency in oh. charge of energy efficiency. Ah, okay. We have two agencies in our energy transition policies, Mazen for the big power plants, uh -huh. we do renewables, uh -huh. and uh, AME is the Moroccan agency for energy efficiency. I think in developing I see. thank you. Yeah, because uh, Mr. Makuri mentioned about, Makuri mentioned about this uh, sustainable uh, energy uh, transmission project with the European uh, Union, Germany, or France, or Portugal. That is very interesting initiative of uh, in Morocco. So, we have a question down there. please go ahead. I'm Jean Vitoul, former president of Shenia Marketing. So I will advocate a little bit for gas. On the short term, uh, I, I don't fully agree which, with what has been said just now. Uh, the price of gas in the United States is three dollars per million BTU. Yeah. So it's very cheap. And with the startup of the LNG export out of the US and with the commoditization of LNG, I don't believe that the price of gas will go up. It's true that in Asia and in Europe, with the price of gas index on oil, there could be some time where the, these prices will remain high. But in my mind, it's very temporary, in my mind. So, and, and within the next two or three years, there will be plenty of new uh, liquefaction projects in the US, which will help the gas prices to become more and more uh, a commodity price with a world price, more, more and more. On the longer term, uh, first of all, I, I'm not sure to fully understand uh, your, uh, Mr. Tanaka, your, your guess, your curve on the cost of wind. In my mind, I'm not sure that this cost will go down so, so fast. And as a, as a matter of fact, today, uh, all the renewable prices are still highly subsidized, especially in Europe. Uh, on, on, always on the long term, if you don't build additional nuke power plants in the world, the numbers do not square without high development of natural gas. They just do not fly. So I'm not sure to understand your curve where there is a peak gas in 2030-35. And I'm not sure uh, to understand that. Uh, on the storage of electricity, and this has been stressed uh, by Mr. Cooper, uh, battery, everybody insists about battery. I, I highly believe in the future of hydrogen. And you can produce hydrogen with electricity uh, outside the peak hours. So practically, the cost of producing hydrogen can be negative or almost zero. You can use hydrogen in the fuel cell, even in the cars. Somebody has said that in the car, for the mobility, you will still need battery. It's not obvious in my mind. You have a lot of technology of power to gas to use electricity to produce hydrogen and, this in, and then inject hydrogen into the network of natural gas. So you have still plenty of technology which are under development and which allow natural gas to increase 
its market share, even if uh, the renewables are seen as a solution for everything. Thank you. For your uh, question to my I mean, uh, chart, yes, uh, the 2030 peak of uh, gas is uh, still that chart, the gas is increasing, even with the sustainable development scenario, 450 scenario. Oil peak out very quickly around 2020, Ga coal much earlier. But gas will continue to grow until 2030 or 2040. Yeah, so, but, but, but slowing down, if sustainable scenario or two degrees Celsius or 1.5 happens, because it's still carbon uh, emission happens. By the way, uh, uh, it's, uh, we have 10 minutes more, so let's, uh, I'll give the floor to the panelists to answer some of the questions about price or some of the questions about uh, uh, gas uh, role. Uh, Olivier, let's start with uh, Olivier. <coughs> a, a few comments, and uh, I would like to develop a little bit uh, the issue of the uh, oil embargo uh, to Iran, which is a short-term issue. Um, first, clearly, uh, adaptation was part of the Kyoto Protocol, and in the following COPs, it almost disappeared, and now, as, uh, as you said, it appears quite difficult to cope with uh, 2 degrees or 1.5, and then it's very important to consider, to, to consider adaptation. And I, just, I understand that it will be one important part of the next COP in Poland. It's clear that they will not discuss a lot of, uh, they will not push the, uh, the, the theme of mitigation, but I think it will, it's uh, good news. Second part, what struck me when we discuss about energy is that uh, I remind that electricity re represents 20% of the problem, but 95% of the comments. And when we discuss about uh, renewable energy, we discuss about solar and wind. But in fact, don't forget that 80% of the uh, final uh, energy consumption is non-electricity. Uh, Show uh, a few words on uh, the uh, embargo. The uh, oil embargo on Iran is one of the one important explanation of the high uh, price now, because the thanks to the decision taken by OPEC Plus uh, two years ago, the market is now almost uh, stable, uh, in uh, good balance. Uh, but on the top of that, there is this decision of Trump to set up an embargo against, uh, against uh, Iran. In fact, the spare capacity, uh, the, the stocks are at a uh, low level worldwide. The spare capacity is not so high. Uh, the official figures is 2.7 million barrels per day, or 2.5, and uh, around 1.8 in Saudi Arabia. And uh, my experience uh, at the IEA is that uh, spare capacity, where you don't know exactly when will you get, when it, be, it will be possible to get this uh, production. It may take uh, three months, uh, six months, or one year, because uh, it needs, it's necessary to, need, it needs uh, some investment. So, uh, the, uh, what uh, is for me the most challenging is the reaction of Iran uh, or, uh, uh, to this uh, position of, uh, the, uh, of Trump, and this may create a mess in the uh, 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 Gulf, uh, in the Persian Gulf. Uh, just I remember that uh, the missiles uh, of uh, 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 Iran have been tested on the Strait of Hormuz. And uh, if there is anything which happened, uh, 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 it will be totally impossible to uh, load oil uh, in the Gulf of, uh, in the Persian Gulf. I remind that uh, the Strait of Hormuz, the Persian Gulf, represent 20% uh, of the uh, world oil consumption and 25% of the LNG. 
so uh, this may, uh, it's not uh, a, a new, uh, uh, an increase of the prices. I would say nobody knows at what level it may come. We may come to $200 per barrel because there is no elasticity on the market. And uh, also this uh, situation of, uh, uh, yeah, that's um, the comments I wanted to, to make. And I have very specific views on uh, hydrogen. I'm not a believer. I think hydrogen is the question of religion. <laughs> yeah, we are, yeah, Japanese are very religious about hydrogen, yes. Laila, do you have comments on the stock, I mean, uh, <laughs> spare capacity? Well, I mean, uh, here again, first point, I'm not mandated to talk about short-term markets and Saudi Arabia's <laughs> production policy, again. Second point, Olivier Appert has already made all the comments that need to be made about the spare capacity, so thank you very much, Olivier, yeah, for fine. the, <laughs> well, thank you so much. I mean, you always saves me in, uh, in those meetings. Um, no, but I, I mean, on gas, I, I really want to, uh, because, yes, we can be concerned about what is happening in the oil markets, and I think there was a lot of work being done for to, have, to bring those 25 countries together in the OPEC plus alliance. But there are also some concerns on the gas side, because today in Europe, I mean, I, I agree with the points that was made on the US, but today in Europe, gas prices are $3.5 million uh, per million BTU higher than the same time last year. We don't know what will happen this winter. We don't know if we're going to have uh, a, co a very a colder winter than average or, or not. So uh, these are also, and, and, and in many of these countries, I mean, uh, gas prices are being now reformed and uh, linked to uh, international gas prices as well. So that's, that's also an aspect that I just wanted to highlight as well in the meantime. Thank you, Reda. Dr. Cooper. Um. Well, I address mainly long-term issues, but since uh, Iran has been raised, don't you think that uh, the Iranian problem, in quotes, will be solved by China? Uh, China uh, could take Iranian oil. Uh, it's substitutable for other kinds of oil. And uh, China could well set up a clearing arrangement, which did not use SWIFT or the dollars, uh, U U.S. dollars at all, and Chinese firms operating in the U.S. would have a problem like Total would, but there are Chinese firms that don't operate in the U.S. at all. So is, uh, do you uh, seriously think that Iran will not be able to export its two million barrels a day, say? What I, can, what I heard on the market recently is that uh, uh, the Bank of Kundrun, Kundrun Bank, which is more or less the only bank which has a kind of monopoly of relationships between China and uh, Iran, which is owned by CNPC, has just uh, finished uh, accepting uh, bills uh, by Iran paid either in euro or in yuans. And it is said on the market that for November there is no Iranian oil which has been bought either by CNPC or Sinopec. That's, uh, that's it, you know. Uh, even, uh, even the Chinese have problem with uh, that uh, right that you, ha you American have with the dollar. Uh, uh, may I rem uh, remind you that it did cost $10 billion to BNP Paribas. Talking about November, that's just a week away. Yeah. I'm not talking about November, I'm talking about the next few years. And uh, whatever happens in November uh, has almost already happened. But if I were advising the Chinese government, I could construct a scheme that did not use the U.S. dollar nor would it involve Sinopec or uh, 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 yeah. uh, CNPC, because they both have business in North America, at least in Canada. Um, but um, there's a way to do it, and the question is how imaginative they and the Iranians together uh, will be about bringing it about. And there are lots of two-way trade. It's not just oil from Iran to China, but it's Chinese goods going to Iran. And so 
you, it, it's uh, basically barter with a little uh, fluid to grease it, basically. Thank you. I think the European Union invited China to join that clearing house. Is that right? I have heard that, but I don't know. Okay, let's move to uh, Matsuda-san. Matsuda. Okay, just to make one, one comment on uh, renewable energy. I think we talked a lot about the renewable energy and storage, but uh, obviously we need second and third revolution technology. And what we face about technological evolution is there's two types of death of valley, death valley, valley of death. One is uh, technical valley of death to make you know, new, new technology to be able to be developed fully. That's one. And there's a lot of shortage of supply of financing, one. And second is financial death of value. If though there is a demonstration plant ready to go, there's no one to invest and there's no way to commercialize. So unless we are able to overcome all this value of death in technological development deployment, uh, we won't be able to have revolution. But otherwise, we can have technological revolution which again completely rewrite the energy scene. And IEA World Energy Outlook could be very obsolete in a few years unless they are able to do it. And we have to do that. That's my ending remark. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Than Ladislav. Maybe quick comments on the uh on the, on the price, uh, I think short term, there are definitely some supportive fundamentals for the oil price because uh, demand is still uh, significant. OPEC and Russia are uh, well lined. Then one very specific element with regard to the US where there are some bottlenecks of exporting uh, shale oil uh, by pipe. So uh, probably until the uh, mid next year, uh, there will be some constraints on the uh, on the U.S. market. The, the exports uh, reduced from Iran, of course, and uh, don't forget uh, Venezuela, Libya. There are some countries uh, which still uh, face quite some difficulties. Not taking into account the fact that we have to keep in mind that the level of investments that have been made in the oil and gas industry has decreased very significantly after, by 2014-15 uh, when the oil price collapsed. And there are some uh, impacts that are going to be associated with that. So I think it's quite supportive on the, on the, on the short run, even though uh, for me on the mid run or long term, the key word remains volatility. Thank you very much, everybody, and I uh, really appreciate very, uh, your participation to the interesting game I raised, and uh, I, I hope everybody enjoyed the discussion here.